Hi, this is Christoph from Skellico.com, and in this episode, I'm going to do things a little bit differently because I'm more of a visual learner. So I'm going to show you how big of an impact optimizing images can really have. So in this, the first example here, which we're going to talk about serving the right size images, uh, we have a typical use case where we have a uh, just an image that maybe we uploaded or found online. And this image is 900 by 700 pixels, and let's say it's 96 kilobytes. Now on your page, maybe you have a mobile user or a tablet user going to one of your pages, and the container holding this image is only about half of the size. It's 450 by 350 pixels. Now even if you're resizing it with CSS, where you're taking the image, you're saying, hey, I want this image to fit 100% of the width and height, or you hard code 450 by 350 pixels, even if you do that, you're still passing in the 96 kilobytes across the wire. So uh, those 96 kilobytes are gonna have to be downloaded before the user can see that image in the container. That seems a bit wasteful, right? But a lot of us are doing this, and I'm doing this on scalarcode.com as well. So this is something that I'm really gonna have to sit down and fix if I wanna see some increase in load times uh, and uh, be more generous to my mobile users so they're not downloading as much. So how can we fix this? Well, what we, we really need to do instead of resizing with CSS alone, we need to create another derivative version of this image.jpg. So let's say that we create a version that fits for this specific container. Maybe we have a media query in our CSS that says, uh, you know, for this type of, of size uh, browser. Well, we could do the same thing with images. We could say we could have like four different or five different sizes of this image and let's say we're going to have image image 2.jpg and this is the exact same image the only difference is that we're going to have a different size and let's say that it's exactly that size container so 400 by 350 pixels and i know i'm going to have to work on my handwriting but bear with me here i mean we're cutting that that image in half so i wouldn't be surprised if we saw a drop in the size to like 50 kilobytes. I mean, I'm just making numbers here, but if you played with it, you probably wouldn't be too far off. Maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, depending on uh, how, how the image is. So now, instead of when the user goes to your browser and requests for this image inside of this container, instead of loading this image that's 96 kilobytes, we're only transferring the 50 kilobytes. So you're not even getting this request here. It's going to be requesting this file immediately, and you're cutting, you're, you're reducing your bandwidth by 50% on this image alone. Now that's pretty big, especially if you have a lot of images, or it's a heavy page. I mean, if if you cut every image in half and you get about a 50% reduction, you can literally cut your image size by about 50% or so. So that's a pretty big change in page weight. This will reduce the page load times or the image load times, and it will also reduce your bandwidth costs, which kind of brings us to the next, uh, the, the point number two, which is to have CDNs serve your image. And that's where the, the bandwidth reduction and cost can, can really come in, uh, since most services charge you by bandwidth. So let's take a look at that. All right, so the second point, like I just said, is to use a CDN. Now, there's a lot of literature out there on CDNs, so I'm gonna to try to, to go pretty quickly on this point. But just in case you're not aware of how CDNs work or what they're, they're useful for, then let's walk through this example. So uh, <clears throat> let's say that you have a user on the right here who is requesting images or anything really from our server here. Now, let's say that this person is somewhere in China and uh, this server is somewhere in the US. It's a pretty big distance. If you look at the Earth, that's a long distance for your packets to travel. Now, internet's pretty fast nowadays, especially if you're going across continents, it's gonna be some fiber optics that are pretty fast. In fact, they're pretty close to the size, or the, I'm sorry, the speed of light. Uh, by a, it's all relative, of course, it's not exactly close to that. Uh, some could argue that it's not that close, but really it is, it's pretty close. We've come a long way. So even if we manage to increase the speed a little bit, it's not gonna be by a big percentage. 
unless we start bending some rules of physics. So what can we do instead? Uh, let's say, you know, in this example, the user is trying to request images, but just to get the image and back is 700 milliseconds. That's quite a bit of time, especially if you're downloading a lot of images or files. So that's where CDNs come in. And what is a CDN? A CDN, which is Content Delivery Network, by the way, is going to do this. Instead of having to fetch this really far distance, if you get a good CDN, they're going to have a location that's closer to, to the user. In fact, China is a pretty big country, so if you get a good CDN, they probably have a node somewhere in China. So instead of crossing the big, vast lands and oceans, what's going to happen is the user is going to request here, and the CDN is going to pull files from your server. So depending on your cache rules, which we're going to cover in a little bit, this is what you have. This is much shorter distance, and let's say that you get about 100 milliseconds here. You just shaved off 600 milliseconds. If you have a lot of files, or even if you don't, even for one file, that's a pretty big increase. Of course, I just created those numbers. Uh, you know, it depends on a lot of things, what the round trip time is. But I wouldn't be surprised to see these kinds of optimizations, especially if it's over very long distances or if the user has very poor internet or is on a mobile phone or something like that and is traveling, uh, switching from tower to tower. So this is how it happens. So, but now let's talk about the third point, which is to compress images and lower quality of these images as well. What is compressing and reducing quality? You're probably already doing this, but if not, this is a really easy way to, to slim down your images. So uh, let's start with reducing quality. If you, have, if you use something like Photoshop, or there's other kinds of software out there that do it for you, but if you use Photoshop and you've ever saved an image for web, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. You go to save, the menu, file, save, save for web, and then you can toggle what kind of quality image you want. And it's usually a slider or you can put in a number and you have high, medium, uh, low, very high, things like that. But what's going on there? What it's doing is it's going to lower the quality of your image. And here's a good example. Let's say you have an image.jpg and these two images are the same except the quality is different. You could slim down from 45 kilobytes to 39 kilobytes just by toggling that, that option. The thing is, you're going to start seeing more pixels so that your image is going to be more pixelated. So you have to find a happy medium where you're not lowering the quality so much that it's going to be looking bad on your site. Uh, but you also don't need to have very high. Most of the time, if you take it down from very high to somewhere between medium and high, you barely notice a difference or the notice or the, or the difference that you would notice. Nobody else would notice on your website. So you're literally getting free kilobytes of, of saving. Uh, now, if you're doing it in Photoshop, that's a bit of a manual process. Thankfully, there's some software you could, you know, put in one in here. This is the software doing its work, and it spits out the other image, and then you can upload upload that to your servers. Uh, there's some different ones. I'll try to link some below the video to help you out there. Now, the compressing part of it is another area that really helps you out. There are compressing algorithm, algorithms that can really slim down the weight, and also it can strip out meta tags that you really don't need in your images. Uh, all you need is the image name and a few other metadata uh, properties. But in images, sometimes you have a lot of metadata, pro metadata properties, like what kind of camera took it, the latitude, longitude of where it was taken. I mean, these can get really complex depending on what kind of uh, device took the image. So those are things to keep, keep in mind. And compressing is, is fairly easy. You can use gulp optimization packages. So you can just type in gulp optimize or something like that, and it will take images in a folder, for example, and spit them out that are, are compressed and optimized. There are also services online that can do this for you. So it's uh, it's not too bad. It's, it's pretty easy and uh, free, free kilobytes, really. Now, the fourth one that we're going to look at is the, the caching that we talked about with CDN. So telling uh, a browser or a device, hey, cache this image for this long. Again, that's a very cheap and easy way of, uh, of not even hitting the network and introducing latency. So let's take a look at that. This example here is adding cache control headers to your images. 
And this specific example is more uh, uh, the, the way it looks like on S3. But if you look in headers, HTTP headers, when you're uh, creating requests and getting responses back, for example, if you pull up the inspector in DevTools or Chrome DevTools, then you can see in the HTTP headers that it replies back with this answer that has cache control and then max age or however it's set up. So this is more of S3, but bear in mind that it, you know, it looks the same pretty much anywhere. The way that you can do it in S3 is you can add this cache control headers metadata. And what you want to do is just type in cache control like this, capital C's, and then you're going to add max age equals and a number in seconds. This number here, 5 million and some change, equals about 60 days of uh, caching. So the way that these headers work is, is the following. Let's say you have a browser that hits your website. And as you saw <clears throat> with the latency, can, it can be a very big problem. The user goes to the server or CDN and fetches the image back. But what if instead of, of having this latency on the network, what if we cut that off completely? Well, this is where that comes in. The browser is smart enough to look at this tag and say, you know what, we're going to store this image because it's telling us to. So the next time this user comes back, if it's within 60 days, according to this number, then we're not even going to fetch that from the network again. We're just going to assume that it hasn't changed. All right, so the user goes on the site. Instead of fetching that file from the server, it already has it in cache and it loads it very, very quickly. You don't even see it load usually. Now, in 60 days after this, after the first time they fetched, then the server, or I'm sorry, the browser is going to check back with the server and say, hey, I need to check my cache, make sure it's up to date according to your, to your property. And then if it hasn't changed, it'll cache it back. If it has changed, it'll use the new, the new max age value for that new image and it will reload it and refetch your cache. So again, these are really, really simple ways of optimizing images. But the fact of the matter is a lot of websites don't do this. And this is so easy and it's free optimization, right? You're reducing all that latency and it's, it's fantastic. So don't forget to add your cache control headers for all of your images and determine the length of time. I think 60 days is pretty good. A lot of people do a lot longer than that. Sometimes they do a year and then they'll change the name of the file to force the browser to refetch the images. Uh, you know, different approaches for different people. Now let's look at the fifth and the last optimization that I'm going to cover in this uh, in this episode, and that is serving the right format image. Let's take a look at that. What in the world do I mean by serving the right format? You may not know this, but JPEG and Ping are some pretty old file formats, so they're not the best at compressing images. Uh, a lot of times they're just heavier than they really need to be. So different browsers have come in and said, you know what, we're gonna create or, no, uh, or we're gonna use a different format, I should say. And in this example, Chrome is using a format called WebP. You can Google it, I'll link it below the video. And this WebP, WebP format, the reason it's so important is because it's 26% smaller than Ping. 25 to 34% smaller than JPEG. Now, if those numbers are really accurate, that is some serious optimization because consider this, you're not changing the quality of the image or if you if it is, then it's very slim to none so you can't even notice the difference. All you're, you're doing is putting in the exact same image, spitting out a smaller image. I mean, it doesn't get easier than that. The problem, the problem, is that not the same, or the browsers don't use the same formats. So I think WebP only works for Chrome and maybe some other versions of newer other browsers, but other browsers have come out or are using different, different kinds of formats, which is a big bummer. Uh, while they're doing that, I don't know, but I really wish they'd get on board and use the same format so we could all switch to some of those more efficient formats. But if you, you know, since we're not there yet, what you can do, instead of serving JPEG, you can check if the, the user browser is Chrome. If it is Chrome, then you can serve the WebP format. If not, default back to JPEG or the other browser format if you have it. So all you have to do is you get different format images. So the exact same image in JPEG or in Ping and then in WebP on your server or S3 or something like that. 
this concludes this episode. I hope this helps you out. Uh, let me know what you think about this format. It's a little bit different, a little bit crazy, but sometimes seeing things can really put it into perspective instead of just hearing somebody say it in front of a screen. So uh, let me know what you think. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. I'll try to put as much information in, in the description as possible. Let me know what you think, and thanks for watching.